Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, Bob Zico, I see you here. Oh, hello. Um, Neta. There we go. Yeah, come on up. Calder, Jacqueline. Who else? Shani. She's here. Good morning, everyone. How did everyone sleep? I was in bed before the buses came home. So to those of you who stayed the whole time, my, my hat's off to you. You are very impressive for being here this morning. We are so excited to be here. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Yael Weisberg. I'm a vice president at the foundation where I focus on our community facing teams. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I hope I do before the end of the conference. Um, I am so excited about this panel today. I have heard multiple times the topic of generative AI, of chat GPT come up in previous panels. I know that many of you in the room could just as easily be up here speaking on the panel. So my hope today is that this is more of a conversation both between the panelists um, and certainly with, the, with you all in the audience as well. Um, we have a long panel today. I think we have 90 minutes. And what we do not want to do is sit here and talk at you for 90 minutes. So my suggestion is that we keep our panel relatively brief, maybe 30, 35 minutes or so, and that we spend most of the time in conversation. So please um, uh, keep track of your questions. Feel free to engage. Like I said, I know that there are many experts in the audience as well as on the panel. Um, I'll keep my remarks very brief because you all are the experts. Um, I just thought I would frame a little bit about how I have been thinking about this topic and how we at the Wikimedia Foundation have been thinking about it. As some of you may know, when Mariana Iskander joined the foundation about a year and a half ago, she asked us to anchor the work that we do, anchor our annual plan in two things, in the movement strategy and in the overarching question of asking what does the world need from us now? And two years ago, when she asked my team to look into this question of what the world needs from us now, we identified four external trends that are really affecting the work of the Wikimedia movement. Two of those trends were the changing nature of search, so how people are looking for content online is rapidly changing, and the changing nature of content, how content is created is rapidly changing. A year later, when we went to refresh those trends, even, even in, the, in the previous year, things had changed dramatically. And those two topics of search and content have really been synced up into one meta question about how is generative AI changing both how people look for information and how information is created. Some of you attended the community call we did back in May on the topic of generative AI. I know Galder, you were there, and a few others, both on the panel and the audience were there. And a few things I've learned in the past couple months thinking about this topic one, it's very, very easy to articulate the threats of generative AI. Uh, the threat of disintermediation, the fact that people are in third parties are using Wikipedia content or Wikimedia content and end users don't know it's coming from Wikimedia. It's a huge threat. Um, I think the threat of deteri deteriorating the quality of our content is obviously a threat. And, and the one that concerns me the most is the disincentive disincentivizing of human contributors, right? So as generative AI creates content, what does that do to the people, the lifeblood of our movement, and how does that disincentivize them from creating content? So naming the, the threats, I think, is quite easy. I don't think it's actually quite difficult to name the opportunities either. I think of um, the way this movement has been using AI for decades now. I think of the one and a half million new articles that have been created using the content translation tool in languages like Ukrainian, Arabic. Yesterday, I even learned Georgian. There you are. <laughs> um, so there's an incredible opportunity, I think, for tools like AI and certainly like gener generative AI to expand who can participate in our movement. I think the harder thing than naming the opportunities and the threats is actually charting a path forward. So what do we do? How do we actually take advantage of tools like this or push back against tools like this and, and use this moment to help us achieve our 2030 strategy? And that's what I'm hoping our panel can help us think about today. You all are experts, certainly in education, and, it, and generative AI is there at your front door, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and so what I'm gonna ask us to do today is start by introducing yourselves Tell us who you are for those who may not know you. 
and maybe situate this question, this idea of generative AI in the context of your work. How is it confronting you today in your work in education in the movement? And I will start with you, Galder. Okay, why not? Um, I'm Galder Gonzalez. I'm from the Buzz Wikimedians User Group. Um, I'm interested in the topic of AI, and I think there are different perspectives if you are talking about uh, English Wikipedia or other languages. Um, some larger languages will be included in the English Wikipedia section, but the difference between English and the second one that will be like Spanish, French, German, Russian, is in, in generative AI is, is huge. Um, there are these threats you mentioned, especially knowing how a text is generated, uh, is it true or not, these kind of things. But there are also some interesting opportunities that we could be using. For example, as you may know, some of you may know, we have Wikipedia, that is the uh, children version of Wikipedia. And it's actually very easy to give an English article, a really long English article, and say summarize for second grade students. This is actually possible. And it gives a quite good summary. It's not, I mean, uh, a teacher could maybe do it more interesting, but it gives a quite interesting summary. And you can even ask, like, can you give me two examples I can use for explaining this to a child, a child and, and they give it. And then translating it is not so difficult. Uh, there are some languages where it's impossible, but in Basque, for example, it's, it's possible. And don't, so you, have, you can have content for different audiences from the same content, from a curated, good quality, well-structured content. So this will be something that is interesting to know and to test. And also, we have articles in English Wikipedia which are great, but are huge. And giving an um, automatic summary will be something that a lot of people could use. I mean, it's not something only for children. It's something you can use. Uh, of course, it means that we have to summarize by hand a lot of articles to teach the tool how to do that. And we don't have infrastructure for doing that and etc. but uh, that is possible. We are also using uh, Generative A in illustrating articles. Um, you can't, well, you can, actually you can illustrate a historical article, but it will not be accurate, so you shouldn't um, use to illustrate something that is historically non-accurate, but for example, for mythology, for literature, for these kind of things, there are a lot of things that you can use, and there is people using also in Wikisource to illustrate, like, this is a, um, I don't know, this is a, a tale from, I don't know, what which culture or it is, and we are also creating mytholo Basque mythological uh, figures in, not only for children, but for everyone, because it's a mythology that is ha doesn't have um, an image like Greek mythology has. So this will be things that we can be doing. On the other side, we have um, we have a problem where we are depending on a machine who is uh, quite good writing in English, but when you translate it to another language, it creates some modism and some ways of expressing that are not native to that language. And talking to experts in, in AI, not more, way more experts than me, they, what they say is that, that um, this can make a language change. And if the language change, the next model will be based on that model that has been created by a machine, so the language will change. And I have heard that this is happening already in Arabic, where the sentence order is changing, uh, because people is using more uh, automatic translates and, and this kind of thing. So this is also something that the quality of languages will be lower if we only depend on, on machines. So humans must make it cool, make it interesting, make it funny. <laughs> this is something that machines are not so good at. And I think that those are my two points. Thanks, Galder. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, good morning. Yeah, my name is Bob Cummings, and uh, I edit when I edit on the English language Wikipedia. I edit uh, 
properties on the Register of National Historic Places in the U.S., so historic properties in my neighborhood. Uh, on my day job, I work at the University of Mississippi, and um, I teach and research digital writing. So a lot of my last 12 months have been consumed on this topic. Um, I think it's important to talk about, uh, I focus mainly on AI generative writing, but AI generators also impact images and many other forms of media. Uh, but because of my job, I focus mainly on how AI writing generators are impacting what it means to be literate. And usually I try to focus on three main points when we talk about this topic. The first is that until about a year ago, if you encountered and read text, you knew that a human wrote that text. It might not be someone that you know. It might be someone that you know. It might be someone you trust. It might not be someone you trust. It might be one person. It might be multiple people. You might not know who the people are, but you knew it was people that wrote that text. That is no longer true. This is a radical shift in literacy. And we're in the process of figuring out exactly what that means. Um, second thing that I like to talk about is AI writing generators represent a manipulation of letters, not a manipulation of knowledge. So an AI writing generator has been called, and I think accurately so, a parlor trick. It can produce text, but it doesn't understand the text that it produces. You, as the human, create the meaning, my personal belief, when you read the text. The meaning does not exist until you, as human, read the text. Um, personal belief, but I think it's a defensible one. Third thing that I um, often talk about when we talk about this is the problem of what the folks that are in the technical community will explain as explainable AI. So AI can give you answers, but it can't tell you how it got those answers. And so if you can't explain it, you can't teach it. And so folks that are in the development community that work on um, automatic writing evaluators, they, they're pretty sophisticated. And if you program an automatic writing evaluator on certain technical traits, it can quote unquote look at a piece of writing and it can give you a very accurate score according to the rubric that you gave it. But it cannot tell you how it arrived at that score outside of the rubric that you gave it. So for it's, removing humans from literacy. It is a manipulation of letters and it is also unexplainable. So those are three primary traits that I try to talk about. I wanted to just say briefly and respond to the challenge of saying positive things as well. First thing I would say is that one of the things I love about this community is in this conversation is that you have some of the deepest experience of any community in the world with engaging artificial intelligence. You've been dealing with bots and creating Wikipedia articles for almost two decades. Now, I know that's a, the, most of the bots are very simplistic, but integrating how someone else's programming affects the writing that you're trying to achieve, that's the, really on the forefront of collaborative writing and what it means to write as a person um, in, this, in this time. So I think this community has a lot of experience already in dealing with this and centering the human experience in writing. Because we know when we look at a Wikipedia article, humans wrote this article. So if I don't want to challenge, I don't want to push things into a, a, a dichotomy of human versus non-human, but if, if it plays out that way, you're at the forefront of establishing humans in literacy. Um, last thing I would all say is that on the positive side, I think there are potential great applications for AI in terms of teaching and learning in the conversation around tutoring. Folks may remember about a decade ago, a lot of the higher education conversation was around MOOCs and how massively open online courses were going to displace universities um, and completely transform learning. Didn't quite work out that way, but one slanderous phrase that came from that conversation was, robot tutors in the sky. So you may remember there was this sort of misguided idea that robot tutors would be tutoring everybody on how to learn in a particular class. 
if you tone down that vision and you think about where AI succeeds, AI succeeds in writing generators when you have structured inputs and structured outputs. And if I'm struggling in a class and you can narrow down the content where I'm struggling, then you can turn that over to a responsibly developed AI to give me a chance to dialogue and Q&A with this AI bot, if you want to call it that, around where I'm struggling. So I think there are potential ways that we can look at this technology to increase engagement, maybe increase engagement in the online learning space. So. Uh, yes, should we, can we try it this way? Thank you, I'm Zico van Dijk. I'm a German who lives in the Netherlands. I have a Wikipedia background. I studied history and linguistics and now I've become a kind of wiki expert as I'm interested in how a wiki works in general. And there's one particular thread. I'm not sure whether we all are that aware of it and uh, it's quite particular but very vital and I'm going to elaborate on that in a story, but maybe later. Thank you. My name is Neta Hussain. Uh, I am a Wikimedian who mostly writes medicine-related articles. In my day job, I'm a radiologist. So my day is filled with looking at images of internal organs of people, and I'm therefore very much involved in the image side of AI. Um, in radiology, we have always been speaking about the hype cycle surrounding AI. There were hypes coming and they would say computer-aided diagnostics will take away your job and so forth. So there were cycles and, um, and all these products that, that usually worked well in the laboratory sandboxes, they failed to work in the actual clinical environment. So, but in the last six months when generative AI proliferated so much, I understand that things are different now. So we need to have more attention towards what generative AI is doing. Um, and uh, in my work also we can see that people are very excited and also concerned about uh, the potential of AI. I also educate medical students and we have already started using images generated by AI to illustrate um, our presentations, illustrated our thesis summaries and so forth. And this is a peculiar case because we want images of say a depressed woman, an angry man and things like that and we don't want to put pictures, uh, photographs of people onto uh, the presentations. And what do we do then? We, we don't have the resources to hire a graphic editor to you know, visualize these things. And it's much easier with uh, one of these generative AI techniques to create all these images. And that was something we have been experimenting with um, these days. And um, as educators, we want our students to learn critical thinking. And what students, for example, uh, we, would, we don't want a student to ask the AI if it's good to take drugs or so forth. And I mean, you could, uh, you have to weigh this decision on your own and come, come, come to a decision on your own. So, uh, we, so I, one, one of the potential challenges that I see is that people would offload their critical thinking to AI, particularly our students. And secondly, it's about problem solving skills. We want all our students to be good problem solvers. But what I saw with ChatGPT is that it writes excellent code. You, you ask them to write, solve a problem using you know, Python code. It does beautifully. It gives you, you know, all the reasoning about all these steps that you have to follow while writing a code to get a particular answer. Um, and this is, this, is skill, this is a skill that we want our students to retain. We don't want to offload completely to AI. Of course, we could use AI as a tool, but we don't want to offload it completely. And thirdly, it is creativity. Um, when it comes to generative AI in imaging, you could ask AI to, if, without even a clue of what you want to get from the AI, you could just give text prompts and AI would generate beautiful images with you know, much vibrant creativity than the person had not thought about before. So problem solving, critical thinking and creativity are the things that our students are going to offload to AI and we have to find ways to meaningfully engage AI with the students to make sure that they don't offload it completely there and they retain some of these skills. That's it. Thank you. Yes, I think that creativity is a term that is being um, enriched 
and kind of redesign. And I'm Jacqueline Bucio, I'm from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, National Autonomous University of Mexico, and I work with MOOC. Uh, we were actually with Coursera, and yeah, it didn't change the education, no? We have 140,000, 40 uh, MOOCs, but um, it's, they are really helpful. But this is, I think this is the moment for Wikipedia. We, of course, uh, uh, Jen and I uh, knocked at our door, and we are designing a course that is going to start tomorrow. And what did we do? Okay, what are we going to teach to these teachers? That we, what we've been hearing is anguish, a lot of fear. That uh, high school teachers, for instance, in our university, are saying, "Hey, I won't teach anymore. It's the moment for retirement. No, I, I can keep up with this." But we went. Uh, we create this course called GNAI Playground. We want to put them in a space where they, a safe space where they can play with GNAI. See that maybe can be fun. And this course has five sections. The first one is text-to-text -text Gen AI, just to know and practice what it is, just to grasp the, the, the notion. And then uh, the second phase is uh, text to all the other Gen AIs there is, no? text to image, text to audio, text to video, text to courses, entire courses just constructed by JI. And then the, the third section is uh, uh, reading and writing and researching you know, all these uh, um, tools to research so quickly with Gen AI. And then the fourth section is ethical thing. Let's construct a code of conduct for the courses. What uh, the university is not going to give us the code for ethical code. We have to construct it. Every classroom has to construct it. No? And if it's with the students, the best. But uh, uh, every teacher has to come up with one code. And then this, the final section, that's my section, because uh, Wikipedia is going to be integrated as a space for authentic assessment, for critical thinking. I want to make uh, Wikipedia visible as a, um, what do you call this uh, thing you use in a pool when you, that you, if you don't know how to swim, you, as a floating, as a floating device. Hey, you can use this as a floating device and survive Gen AI and explain how they can use it as, a, as an authentic assessment tool. So that's my, my problem right now and it starts tomorrow. So I'm finishing <laughs> still with the <laughs> design. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Is this a MOOC you're teaching? Can we join? <laughs> can we participate in the course? No. Nice, nice. Um, well, I'm even more excited about the panel now because you all prompted so many questions. I think I have a question for the educators on this panel. So that's, I think, Bob, Jacqueline, and Neta, do you teach as well? Yeah, I think you all talked about the um, something that's so core to, to Wikipedia is critical thinking and kind of how you bring that, what historically we've understood to be the human element, to writing. And I'm curious, I know you all think about um, how this is shifting how students are thinking, uh, the metacognitive process. I know some of you are working specifically on the Q&A process of generative AI. And I wonder if you can tell us how you're seeing this affect your students in the classroom. Maybe I'll start with you, Bob. Thanks. So I'm very fortunate in my home department of writing and rhetoric at the University of Mississippi. We've been actively engaging AI writing generators for the last year. So we've been putting them in our writing classes. And what we ask students to do, something I've been calling the DEER framework, D-E-E-R. So D for lower, okay. Um, D-E-E-R, so D for design, E for evaluate, E for engage, and R for reflection. So we take a larger project, a paper, or it could be any kind of academic project, and we design smaller stages for it. Then we evaluate what AI tools are available. Then we engage the AI tools. The students engage the AI tools. This is what we encourage them to do. And then they reflect on the experience of using the AI tools. Certain tools are good for certain things. So for instance, if I'm writing an argument paper as a student, um, one of the problems students often have is finding counter arguments. So they, they fall in love with their topic and they're very good at arguing their topic, but it gives them blindness as to what the other arguments are. Um, they can use an uh, AI tool we used Fermat, and Fermat helps them find counter arguments to their tool. 
or they can use a tool called Elicit. Elicit helps them find sources. But then once Elicit finds the sources or once Fermat finds the counter arguments, they have to read and evaluate them and find out if they're actually appropriate. And then we give them space to reflect on that. So this engages critical thinking. And these are exactly the skills that future employers are going to want our students to be able to use, which is to understand that I have a task find which AI tool I want to use for that task, and then evaluate how it's going to be useful for that task. So that for us, this is what it means to write with AI in the classroom. It hasn't been flawless, but I can tell you the one feedback that we've gotten pretty consistently from our students in the reflection segments is, I just want to write it myself. Often, the AI can be so off target that the task of sorting through what the AI has said versus what you want to say can be a, a net loss. Not always. So that's another factor in engaging and evaluating the tools for the tasks that you're trying to use. And so it quickly becomes they share among each other which tools are better to use for those tasks. And so that feeds into the evaluation loop as well. Yeah, uh, I have university level students writing their master's thesis with us. Um, and they have been, you know, far advanced than me in finding which tools are better for doing what and um, how do you use this particular tool in such a way that it won't plagiarize the content and so forth. Uh, so they are way advanced, I would say. Um, and then um, I have with I have talked with my fellow uh, teachers, and what we see is that um, they would pe students would have their own content. I mean, they think of their own critical argument and they put it uh, in the paper. On the other hand, they also use generative AI to find arguments that they did not know earlier. So in a way, this is enriching the text. But on the other hand, right now, uh, most of the uh, you know, chat GPT like tools, they are not providing good references to what they are doing. So they would, these tools would provide you answers, it would provide you new, new perspectives, but there are not references. Um, there is a tool called, you know, Perplexity AI, which is trying to kind of give references to some of the statements that it is giving out, but uh, the referencing system is not yet uh, in good place. Um, so the students still have to do some work to find, uh, you know, to find the appropriate content, appropriate uh, uh, papers or textbooks from where they have uh, sourced their material. So uh, their work is, with generative AI, they are doing way better work, but uh, their work is still limited by the fact that they need to add references to their statements. Yeah, last week we were at the Coursera conference at Mexico City, and Jeff Majangalda, the CEO, said that he is using ChatGPT as an assistant. So if he has an idea, just go to ChatGPT and ask, it, give me some more names for this, more creative ones. So he uh, is using it as an, as an assistant. What I think is, teachers, we have to think the way to make visible this conversation we are having with these tools. Make it visible in terms of these metacognitive strategies we are using. How can we make that visible and be conscious of that? How teachers, what tools are we providing to the students to interact and make visible these metacognitive strategies? And metacognition is also at the same level of critical thinking, I think, right now. I'm going to see if I can get this to work. It does. Um, I am very encouraged by this idea of the, the idea of finding counter arguments. Using generative AI to find counter arguments is very compelling to me. I remember a philosophy class I took my freshman year of college, and I had this brilliant idea, and I could not think of a way to tear it down. And of course, there were dozens, if not hundreds. So that's that's very encouraging. Um, Zico, you told us that you had a comment or a story you wanted if, to tell us, and I'm curious allowed, what it is. I hope you won't find it too off topic, but you will see where it is going to. It was in 2011, and there was a German politician, the Minister of Defense, whose political career ended abruptly. What had he done? Well, in his PhD thesis from years ago, they found plagiarism. And uh, there were, was a series of cases like that. There were also people, also Wikipedians, they created a wiki to examine collaboratively PhD theses. And uh, a couple of politicians lose their jobs. It was a huge scandal, and uh, my Dutch friends, they never understood that, this obsession of the Germans with titles. 
At the time, I, was, uh, I worked for a professor in Germany, a linguistics department, and I gave seminars about wikis, Wikipedia, classroom, etc. for future uh, teachers of German. And I said to him, Michael, I want to do a seminar on plagiarism. And he wasn't convinced uh, at first how it fits into the department, but he finally agreed. And what you do, well, I prepared uh, cases of plagiarism in literature and the development of the modern thinking of copyright in the 18th and 19th century. And I quickly understood that I was going to the totally wrong direction and that the student needed something very differently. They were so nonchalant about plagiarism. They said they are not interested in the news or politics, and we had as a side topic art forgery, and they fought these forgerers. They're actually quite cool people and funny people. And I asked them this question, dear students, imagine that you are allowed to vote for uni your university, how to deal with plagiarism. So if a student is caught with plagiarism, um, should the university kick him out or give her a second chance? And all, nearly all students voted Give a plagiarist a second chance. And I, I have a great heart and I, I wish a second chance for everybody, but I told them this. Imagine you go to an employer, you want a job, and you come from a university that gives plagiarists a second chance. And there's another candidate, he's from a university, that doesn't give a plagiarist a second chance. What do you think, what will the employer do? And some were still not convinced how important the topic is. And then I, <laughs> I, got, I went full berserk. So here for the record, I'm showing here 50 euros. And I told them, dear students, this is a worthless piece of paper. You cannot eat it. You cannot live in it. You cannot travel with it. It is worthless unless people believe that it has a value. And if people lose trust in currency, hell will break out. Today you will have chaos and tomorrow Hitler. We have done that. So, dear students, in a couple of years, you are getting to have a worthless piece of paper. They call it diploma or master degree or some rubbish. It is absolutely worthless unless people believe that it represents something. You are learning and that you are diligent, etc. If people read in the newspaper all the time about plagiarism in academia, your parents or people who don't go to university or decision makers, then your diploma will be a worthless piece of paper and you are wasting your time right now. So and don't get me wrong, it was actually a very nice seminar. We had a good atmosphere. I had People create fake papers with plagiarism and the other group had to detect the plagiarism and we discuss whether it makes sense. Is it, is it easier? Does it help you under what circumstances to commit plagiarism and do the risks? And at the end of the seminar, so I, it was absolutely, it was their idea. So two students, all by themselves, they talked to the whole seminar, they confessed that they had committed plagiarism in high school, in their final exam, and the only reason that they were there as university students was plagiarism. And now imagine the atmosphere in the seminar in a country, in a culture where plagiarism is a big taboo. So, and now I hope nobody is wondering, hey, Dr. van Dijk, why are you telling us this? Wikipedia is a worthless pile of shit, sorry, kilobytes. <laughs> it is absolutely worthless unless readers believe that there's quality, there's something in it. And if readers suspect that Wikipedia is not a monument to the human genius, but that Wikipedia is starting to hallucinate, what are you going to answer? And what, what, what my students, they are, they are okay people, they are decent people like Wikipedians, but maybe they didn't fully understand what this is actually about. So, sorry for the lengthy story. Thank you. Yes? Oh, Shani. 
Dr. Evan Sheen Sigalov, I assume soon. you did not use soon. 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 I assume Very you soon. did not use ChatGPT to write your thesis. No, but I did ask it a lot about data literacy, and I was absolutely not happy with the results that I received because it kind of fabricated a lot of the references. Because I asked for, hey, give me a summary, a good summary of what is the academic literature saying about data literacy, and it was able to give me. You know, some give, I can show the chat, it's hilarious, right? Because um, it, it actually gave me things that looked real, but the moment that I started to ask about provenance and show me the sources, like who, what are you basing these statements on? Which academic articles it came from? And I requested actually a list of academic articles. It gave me a list, but then, because I'm me, I went to Google Scholar and I started one by one, like dissecting them and check if they're real. And of course, they were all bogus; they didn't exist. So, yes, yes, yes. It's it's um, so that's an aspect that is scary because it's becoming really, really good at showing results that look real but are absolutely bogus. And I want to tie into the conversation that, again, uh, by the way, apologies for being late, but I've been listening to you, so I know what my panelist uh, colleagues have said. And I can say that I think the point that you made um, about uh, critical thinking and, and others as well is absolutely critical, and I actually want to enhance it if, if I have a moment. I think we're actually, you know, in academia, we've been talking in the past two decades, I would say, at least, about digital skills. Some call it 21st century skills. We've been talking about um, digital literacy, and I have been talking, um, not alone, of course, but in recent years, more about data literacy, which is very interesting to me, especially in the context of Wikidata that I've been um, you know, exploring in my PhD. But I think what we are seeing now is a new type of literacy that will be requiring us to address with students. I don't have a name for it, but in essence, what I think, and we're working on a name, so if you have good ideas of how to generative call this literacy. generative literacy, that, that's, we, need to, we need to, I think, think about that. But um, you're, you're an optimistic, I can see that. Um, I think it's not only hallucinating, right? That's one of the side effects. I think there are positives, as Yael was saying at the beginning. I'll get that out there in a second. But I think what um, is very interesting is that we absolutely, already in the classroom, I see that as educators, we are in a place where we need to do a new type of explaining or educating the younger generations and it ties to basically everything that you've said, right? But we kind of need them to, te to, to understand the implications of working with AI, just as we taught them any other technological tools. We know we can throw tools on, at people. It doesn't work. We need to actually teach them the implications of working. And what's happening with Gen AI is that it created another layer between the users of consumers of, of this information and the actual knowledge and the references or the, the provenance of where that knowledge came from. And in that sense, I think our community is maybe the best positioned to actually make that explanation. Possibly because, you know, generative AI is trained on Wikipedia. So when we do our wiki education collaborations in various places in the world, we, it's on us to actually help people understand that, hey, you're not only contributing to Wikipedia, you're helping to train the AI and the different tools. And we're the good guys on the internet, right? But we are also flawed, as I said before, right? We, we have bias, we have missing information, and disinformation. You, you know that Wikipedia is not perfect. So how do we take all of that and teach the new generations this new type of literacy when interacting with Gen AI. We've been talking also about not only critical thinking, but critical ignoring. So I don't know if you've, um, it's a new term in academia coming from um, a professor at, Stan at Stanford University in 2021. And we're looking, I think he's, he's right in saying, you know, 
there's just so much information. How do we make sure that the next generations know how to address it? And in closing, uh, I want to, to highlight two things that I'm doing with my students, a bit, a bit similar to what Zico was doing. I've been, you know, I'm giving a course this semester that's called from Wikipedia to Wikidata, from, from actually from Web2 to Web3, from Wikipedia to Wikidata. And one of the first questions I got at the beginning of the semester is, why can't we use you know, generative AI to produce articles? So I embraced it. I didn't say, oh, don't use generative AI, as I heard some teachers saying the, at the beginning of the week at the OECD meeting that I was, uh, you know, some people are so afraid from the technology, just like they were afraid 20 years ago when Wikipedia started, right? And they said, oh, don't use Wikipedia. Of course, everyone is using Wikipedia and everyone is going to use generative AI. So I think we have to embrace it and do it right. And I've been working with them to actually do a critical thinking exercise, right? Like, let's generate one and see where it's flawed. Let's see where it doesn't work. And especially I'm, I'm um, talking a lot about um, the importance of provenance, of understanding where the reference are and where, what is it based on that we still can't see. We, we're, by the way, we're working on that, right? We're working on um, having a plugin for Wikipedia so we can actually see the provenance of where the, the reference is, which is the missing part for us Wikimedians. And I think Netta also mentioned one more thing that I think we can actually do a lot with, and that is it really can understand uh, programming. So to me, as someone really interested in Wikidata and that effect on, on you know, literacy, and I think it's highly, highly important for students today to get to know Wikidata and work with it and use the visualization. It has to understand better data. Why are we not using Wikidata, um, Gen AI, to write, to create this, um, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, some interface that people can talk in, you know, human natural language and give us the query that we need because that has been a really, one of the biggest threshold is you need to, to learn Sparkle. So I think we're gonna see stuff like that. And I also think, um, you know, there are so many different types of Gen AI. It's not just the text producing, so I think it's about exploring how we can use it with pictures and media in general. There are some Gen AI that actually can create animated films for you with a script. It's really cool. And in academia, there's, there are specific Gen AI that helps you summarize academic articles, which is brilliant, right? And that, that we can use, that our students can use to actually do a good job at writing Wikipedia. So I think it's a vast world of new opportunities for us to explore. And also why I've created a new Facebook group for our community to actually discuss it. So join the group and contribute. Thank you, Shani. Um, one theme I'm hearing, which again gives me hope, is that whatever we do with Gen AI in this movement, we'll do it the way we've done it for 20 years, which is centering the human, right? embracing the technology, but centering humans in it. And I will tell you, I, um, I happen to live in San Francisco in Silicon Valley, and the number of tech leaders who come to us and say, what is Wikipedia doing with this? Because you are kind of the hope we have for generative AI is both thrilling and a little frightening. Um, but I, I love hearing from each of you the plan, like how, how we actually continue to center the human rationality, the human critical thinking in the process of embracing, of embracing generative AI. Um, Galdor, I want to give you a, an opportunity to respond to what you've heard from the panelists. And I also was very intrigued by the idea of generating images of mythological characters. I wonder if you could talk to us about that a little bit and how you might use that in education. Well, it's not, not totally easy. Um, the idea is that there are some mythological uh, items that are quite uh, established, like um, Greek mythology is, well, not from Greece, it comes from the Baroque era, but uh, I mean, we can have some images that are, oh, this is Hermes, this is Aphrodite, this is whatever. But there are some other myths that don't have an image. Most of myths in the world don't have an image or, or images are very limited. But you can actually create uh, images prompting. You can actually ask for that. 
The problem is that um, these images will also have the lack of previous images, so you can have very, uh, I don't know, your Tuvalu mythological warrior in the Disney or Marvel style, and I don't know if this is the best, the best option, but um, you, you can be training and you can be asking, like inserting some elements, inserting some mood, and you can get something that resembles what you have in mind, acknowledging that what you have in mind doesn't exist. I mean, it's something that is con totally constructed. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't say something like, "Okay, create me an image from the Abrahamic religions." Goth. That I mean, no, please. It's something that is different. It's something that is not constructed. And there are a lot of things that we can do with generative A for things that are not that doesn't have an image. Um, in the same way that there are some people who are making illustrations of historical women that don't have an image and they absolutely invent it. And in the same way that there are paintings of battles in the Middle Ages made by people in the 18th century that didn't happen. I mean, so the, are you inventing it? Yes, I am inventing it. And the others invented it. I think that there are some things that we can we can be doing with generative A. Um, l let me introduce another idea. Um, two weeks ago, I tested a page. I don't know which was. I mean, there are a lot of them. I gave a Wikipedia featured article, and it gave me a two minutes podcast with audio, intro, topics, and ending. And you can even write, like, if you want more, checking Wikipedia. Imagine a world where you can check, I don't know, Spotify, I'm not going to make, I mean, whatever, iTunes, whatever you use. Uh, and every morning you have a two minutes short podcast about the topic that is in the main page of your Wikipedia language. This is something that we can do as humans, but it's quite costly. I mean, you, you need someone who will do it. But now you have voices doing it, and it gives a quite good summary that you can actually edit, like, oh, insert this. And we could be doing something like this easily in most of the main languages. I mean, it's quite difficult. I know, I don't know if there are, but in most African languages, in most South Asian languages, maybe this is not going to happen soon. But in some European languages, and for European, I also mean American languages. Uh, this is uh, quite easy to do. You can do also videos, like in, um, how is this called? In uh, uh, med medical, there is this other wiki that is for medical purposes. Uh, Wikimeth, yes? Yes, Wikimeth. They, Yes, <laughs> they have been working with uh, making videos from images and text automatically. We can work on things that uh, will maybe lose the value of, okay, it's not a human who made it, but actually there is a human behind. And if you want to check more, there is another text that has been curated by humans. And I think that this, that intersection will be interesting to check about and to know what the Wikimedia Foundation can provide for or can encourage about doing that. Thank you, Calder. Yeah, and then I do want to open it to the audience because I know folks have questions and comments. So yeah, maybe quickly, Shani, and then get your questions ready. I just wanted to note very quickly that I think uh, the point that hasn't been mentioned and we have to mention is that once we go outside of English, or we haven't stressed, right? But there is a huge, huge gap of languages that we as Wikimedians absolutely care about because we care about the whole world and all of human knowledge, not just in English. And right now, everything we're talking about is kind of centered around the English speaking world. Once we go outside, well, there are some large language models that are also in, in the other biggest languages. But once you get out of the first few big ones, there's a huge drop in the quality and humans are still very, very much needed in terms of creating that high quality content in these languages to 
actually bring us where we need to be. So just noting that. Yeah, thank you for that, Shani. So questions from the audience or comments? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all of you for this amazing information. Uh, so my question is, uh, is to Shani. So ma'am, could you please elaborate uh, a bit more uh, on the that why can't we uh, write article on generative AI, the Wikipedia articles? Yeah. Well, because the most important, I think, part besides neutrality is the ability to reference our work to, right, that's one of our pillars after being neutral what is the second one verifiability hello people wake up you know this this is not a pop quiz verifiability we are basing what we write on facts on different resources that are high quality that are reliable and as of now gen ai can can have access to some of it not all of it by the way the current generations of Gen AI, by the way, don't use Wikidata, which is absolutely weird, right? Because it's machine readable, but it doesn't. It's trained only on Wikipedia, and there's more information on Wikidata than there is on, Wikida on Wikipedia. So we are missing a bunch of information right then and there. But even if you think just of Wikipedia and the references, right? Gen AI gives you a text, and it can't give you the references. So that is the main um, issue at the moment of verifiability. We believe that the next generation may solve it because we're working on creating, well, we've heard different names for it, WikiGPT, whatever, a plugin. We're going to have at some point some generative AI that can give us the reference and it's going to be a real one. Then it's going to be a different ballgame. But until then, not so much. Okay, can I ask one question? I think uh, artificial intelligence can help a lot in our Wikimedia activities. Not only creation of new content. Uh, when we create a new content, it can be reframed uh, to avoid the copyright violations. There we can use it. And also those who are not good at in English, uh, we can use artificial intelligence to frame the sentence. In that case, uh, uh, are we able to create artificial intelligence tools integrated with Wikimedia? Uh, if we have created, I think we can avoid so many repetitive work like fixing functions and fixing grammatical errors or, you know, dividing the topics into various subheadings. Even in yesterday, we have seen some of the graphical representation and we had a conversation regarding the creation of uh, graphical diagrams using Midjourney or any other artificial intelligence tools. So in that case, I think in the future, there will be a lot of debate. Even the talk page or the programs can automatically fix the problem of notability or now, now, now we use boards. So I think our community need to invest a lot of time to create a lot of boards or artificial intelligence tools to reduce the work what we manually do now. In that case, there are two questions. One is what will be the role of our community members in future? We can avoid a lot of even the debate talk page. It will be a talk page between artificial intelligence tools and human being. I think we can uh, save time. So in that case, what will be the role of our community members? That's one question. Second question, how, uh, where, where are we stand for creation of AI tools to integrate with Wikipedia or other Wikimedia platforms? Are we able to combat with that? So uh, I, I think that's absolutely a great question. That's actually the topic of this panel is how we're gonna use AI to impact editing, I believe. So um, again, I go back to what I said earlier is that AI succeeds with structured inputs and structured outputs and Wikipedia articles are highly structured. How will the role of Wikipedians change? It won't. It will be the Wikipedians or the Wikimedians who are using the tools and evaluating the output of the tools to make sure it's responsible and on target and on topic and has appropriate provenance. So I think what the future looks like is what we're doing with our students in the writing classroom, which is to say, I have a particular writing task. There are a range of AI tools. Which ones are good at helping me 
perform my writing task. Um, the, the second thing I want to talk about quickly, if I can borrow maybe mythology for a second, I don't know. Um, if My analogy is if I plant an apple tree and I plant it in toxic, poisoned soil, and that tree manages to produce an apple, do I want to eat it? My analogy is that we cannot forget that generative pre-trained transformers are largely trained on stolen data. You can't scrape everything that's available into massive databases and not steal that information. You're destroying the, the chain of connection to who created that information. And I would like to point out to many people in, who discuss the use of um, our content or Wikimedia's content in those databases, they're ignoring those, those outputs or ignoring the terms of the CC BY SA license. They are not giving attribution and they're not sharing alike on the license. So all of the Wikimedia content that goes in there is also essentially, in my opinion, stolen because the outputs are not giving credit and they're also not passing along the terms of the license. So there's a lot of intellectual property issues that are buried into these outputs. And so I, again, I would go back to, I think this community, our community is really well positioned in terms of engaging what these challenges are and finding meaningful ways to utilize the tools in a responsible way. If I, if I may add a little thing, I can imagine a friction in future, you know, that the world will embrace AI and Wikipedians are sometimes a little bit conservative. And then, as you say, Shani, yeah, students come to your class, to your Wikipedia course, and they want, to do, they want to do this and that, and you say, well, it is not allowed on Wikipedia for that and that reason, like we have with copyright. So uh, I could imagine this is becoming a challenge more and more. Um, I will add a point on the verifiability part that Shani had. Uh, mentioned before, I can already see that in many regional languages, uh, the uh, newspapers or some portals that w that used to be, you know, very reliable, they want to produce more and more content, and they are using generative AI more and more. And people have started seeing inaccuracies in some of their news uh, text. So there was this very famous um, comic thing about um, somebody, a new an actress who owned a um, a, a house in a big city and uh, the newspaper article said that it was sea viewing and there was no sea in that city. So people think that it's because they use generative AI to generate content faster and more easier. So I think in this context it will be important that we Verif we look again at our verifiability policies and see which references are good and which references are excellent. So we will need to grade our external you know, references to make sure that these are high quality, these are not good quality and so forth. So it's time that we, uh, the, the references which we considered earlier to be very good and very high quality, they need to be re-examined in the context of generative AI. I'll just, uh, you're enhancing a point that I w wanted to make about the references and the tools um, compared to, uh, uh, considering your question about which tools we'll need. I think, um, first of all, just to mention, our community has already, as Yael mentioned at the beginning, has already been working with AI and the idea of, you know, machines for quite a long time now, and there has been actually quite advanced and interesting examples. I see Joao sitting here. He's been creating automatically, um, he's been generating Wikipedia articles based on Wikidata using templates. That's like mind, that's amazing, right? Especially for smaller um, communities and languages that are less represented. So I see us trying to use or attempting as a community or exploring ways to do it on a scale, especially for those languages that lack it and using different tools to maybe shorten or uh, give us summaries or do some basic things so there exists good high quality knowledge in those languages, that's one. Two, to, to Netta's point, we will definitely need tools to help us better track references. And I think um, the idea should always be where can Gen AI and machines help us humans to reduce the volunteer labor 
and do some, some things that are really time consuming for us. Like when I checked and I had to go to, you know, to Google Scholar and check one by one, does the uh, person exist? Does the, um, uh, does this, di did they write, if they do exist, which sometimes they did, did they actually write that paper? Does this journal even exist? So that's something that a good machine can actually check for me. So I'm assuming we will be creating these types of new um, tools and ranking, which is something we, at least in the Wikidata community, we've been discussing for years now, the need to actually have a better system to rate the sources, because even if it's facts, we want to know where they come from and we want the provenance, right? So I assume we'll have to deal with these types of things and as Yael was saying, it is going to continue to be centered around humans and, and around machines helping us reduce some of the work that could be done by machines, but checked, always checked and, you know, reviewed by humans. And, and I think more and more, uh, like Zico said, Zico said, I think there's going to be tension. The tension is to me also going to be around the actual content that we offer our readers, which is today hugely based on text. But as we know, even without Gen AI, the world has been changing. People are consuming information through videos, through images, through media. We have not really made the jump. And I I'm hoping, I really do. I'm hoping that um, Gen AI is gonna help us make the jump and pr produce semi-automatically, like uh, Galder was saying, and I, like I was mentioning before, these generative AIs that can create uh, short videos with avatars. So it's, it's not specifically identifiable human, which is sometimes good, and can help us give intros, can help us give summaries of articles and create new ways of engagement with younger audiences. So I think all of that is going to be where we need to take our discussions. Thank you, Shani. I'm going to offer it to Galder, and then if there are other questions, yeah, okay, so maybe we'll do it quickly and open for some questions. Let me tell a very short story. My older daughter is six years old, and this year she was very excited when she, was to the, she went to the primary school because she learned that it exists something called Google, that is Google, but uh, Google, that uh, I actually can answer everything. So since, uh, that I, I want to, I want to, t t t I want to test that. So I open, I, I open Google, and I said, well, okay, what do you want to ask? And quite interesting, her first ever question to a machine was, where do panteras sleep? Um, so she wrote it in Basque and phonetically, so it didn't succeed. I helped her to uh, make it. And then I said, oh, do you know that we have a project called Chikipedia that you can test? Did she find there where Pandora's sleep? No. We went to Wikipedia. Do, did, can we find in the Wikipedia article, even in English, where do Pandora's sleep? No, it's not there. But this is knowledge. This is something that if you ask to chat GPT, it will say, I don't know what to say, in a then or in a three. So where do we find the answer? We found it in commons. In commons, you have lots of images of Pantheras sleeping. Um, imagine a world where you enter Wikipedia and you ask the question, where do Pantheras sleep? And the machine says, okay, this is in commons. And it shows some images of Pantheras sleeping because this is actually pretty easy because we can uh, automatically tag images in commons and you say Pantera asleep, these are images of Pantera sleeping. And they say, okay, they actually, it seems that they are sleeping trees, but they have never seen a Pantera sleeping, so I don't know if commons is BS or not. But that was the answer I gave my daughter. I think the question you're looking for is, do are panthers camouflaged? That, that's why you've never seen them sleeping. Um, Mohammed, I think you had a question. Yes, thank you. And thank you all for this amazing discussion. Well, um, 
I think it's important to consider the potential benefits of generative AI in enhancing and improving the content of all Wikimedia platforms like Wikipedia, but I think it's important too to consider the importance of collaborative um, user contributions to these platforms. So my question is, how can generative AI technologies be leveraged to enhance the quality and accuracy of content on Wikimedia platforms while maintaining the principles of user collaboration and open knowledge? This is the million dollar question. Ned yes, Ned? yes, yes, I just wanted this note. Actually, this, this question was given to me by ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer only a part of the question and I think as a as an editor from uh, the Malayalam community and also editing English language I think that one of the biggest challenges I faced was to find knowledge gaps there is a perfectly written article somewhere which doesn't have information perhaps about the global south it is lacking images in some way it doesn't have references for you know some of the statements so if we could have generative AI help us to find the knowledge gaps in particular articles or okay or say that you are biased in this way or there are no images here so that would be something very revolutionary for me as an editor and many editors who are you know looking for these gaps and trying to fix them uh, anything more maybe Shani Ivan, okay, wait a moment. Uh, I, I, uh, thank you for this amazing panel, and thank you for your group on Facebook. I was one of the first ones <laughs> to join, and I was so happy and excited. Like we are spamming all the time there. Now we have a break because of this conference. Uh, so uh, one thing that it was very interesting about this um, uh, tool uh, instead of Sparkle it will be very, very helpful. Maybe it is very easy for you guys, like tech guys, and because you are, we are already try Wikidata with simple uh, university and even high school um, um, uh, Wikipedia lessons and so on, but this is the, the stop sign, yeah? Um, and the second one, uh, I would like to step back from this like tech uh, and everything and I would like to come back to the, I think uh, 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 Robert uh, said at the beginning um, that we have to understand this because, uh, before we teach this. Uh, and the, the question about uh, language and vocabulary also you've, you've mentioned, it is very important because we can't understand and um, and talk about this in a different levels to the children, to the prime, to the university uh, uh, environment, and even to our employees, if we can't have vocabulary in our own uh, local languages. So how to how to call everything? Like you mentioned, googling. Yes, how we how we will say about this? AIing, <laughs> and in Polish, sztuczno uh, inteligencing. It is very hard to tell the, how it will be called, or maybe internationally, but why English? Maybe it is not <laughs> so uh, cool nowadays to call everything in English. Uh, so I was thinking like we have our Wikipedia slang, yes, like wiki slang, and it's very interesting for newcomers to learn this. Uh, p this is like point of, POV, POV point of view, something, something. So maybe we as a community especially this part who is not very into tech things, can uh, uh, create a group or some hub, we like this word a lot lately, to, uh, to, create, to work on also on the vocabulary uh, uh, about this. Sorry for my English today, but it's a fair day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I think, Philip, there was a question behind you, and then I think we have time for one or two more. Ben, maybe afterwards? Yeah? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think the panel has kind of touched upon that, and I, I just wanted to see this a little bit expanded further uh, because you guys talked about the master thesis and plagiarism, that, uh, that, that kind of note. So I was just wondering, like, what, like, 
who should we give credit if someone uses regenerative AI to compose a text? Because this has a huge ramification when we try to reuse the text for course materials, translating into another languages, or say reusing the image. And of course, uh, because if we don't give the credit where it is due, then that also creates a, a more of a copyright problem for us. But if we give credit to say ChatGPT, you're not gonna be putting your uh, ChatGPT as a co-author on, uh, on your master thesis because you use that tool. So I was, I was just wondering what the panelists think about on this issue. Include it, not include it, or neither? Neta, did you wanna take this one? And then I think Bob and Galdor, I saw some interesting head nods here. I can start then maybe. Uh, my opinion is that you are the human that is using ChatGPT or whatever generative AI tools. So whatever text that you are putting in your master's thesis, PhD thesis, whatever, it's your responsibility to make sure that it's accurate and reliable. So um, you could maybe say that, okay, it was assisted by ChatGPT later on in your acknowledgement, but you can't offload your responsibility. You can't offload your autonomy saying that, look, I got this from ChatGPT and I just put it there. So. Um, you could acknowledge, but anyway, but you are the authority that acknowledges that this is truth and this is verifiable and reliable. So in the US, um, we have uh, different uh, scholarly societies that are engaging the problem of citation and they're the scholarly societies that give us our current rules for citation in the higher education environment. And one of the most prominent ones is the American Psychological Association, APA, as many of you know, and they have recently released guidance on this very question. And the first thing that they point out is that um, generative AI outputs are variable. You can't go back to ChatBT and get the same answer to the same question two times in a row. So it's a bit of a fool's errand, I think, to try to cite these sources. I do think, and I think the guidance gives this um, advice, which is to say, you you need to indicate somewhere in your materials that you accessed ChatGPT in the writing process, but it's for direct attribution. Um, it's, it's very complicated and it probably isn't going to uh, be exactly synonymous with the attribution systems that we now have. I would also invite you to think about, look, We've been using AI for a long time. So anybody that's been using a word processor in the last decade, it goes back to spell check. Um, now you have sent, we've had sentence completion technology for a very long time. Would you cite sentence completion technology? Would you have an expectation to say Google Smart Compose completed this last sentence? No, you wouldn't because you're in control as the author of what the final utterance is. And so it's part of the input process. You may decide to indicate those technologies were on when you were doing your writing, but you would have to, as the author, make that decision about what's appropriate to indicate and what's not. I agree with Neta. Uh, you are responsible of what you upload. And, and, and it's the same. I mean, uh, you, you can be corrected, but you're worth a processor. And you must be able to accept or not accept their correction because sometimes they are grown. Uh, this is digital literacy also. For images, this is more complex because uh, copyright laws annulate copyright of, um, I, I don't know if it's the same in English, but uh, in, in Spain it's a person can be a physical person or a juridic person, like uh, an organization or a, or, or a human being, and copyright only applies for to them. And uh, it's a moral right, so machines don't have morality, so machines can be blamed by any copyright issue. That's why, till there is not a sentence for that, a huge san someone who decides the opposite, uh, all AE-generated images, at least in Europe, are public domain and can't be blamed in other things. For text, it's more complex because you are actually creating that, but the, it, it applies the same. I mean, it doesn't have copyright in the old sense of copyright. Uh, but if you want to create an article only using uh, ChatGPT, of course, all other editors will say, okay, where does it come from? And you will be responsible for the text. If I, oh, sorry, I would like shortly say about Muhammad, about Wikipedia as a wiki, 
collaborative writing and how does the wiki work and I, I'm, go I'm about later the day to tackle some of these issues because again and again we must emphasize a wiki is a very specific kind of social media and we have to keep that in mind. And just to remind, you know, when we have been working with Wikipedia in the classroom or in educational context, we never tell the students to copy from Wikipedia, right? Like we send them to the reference, to, to the sources of where the Wikipedia article is based on. So to me, that's not different. It's just more complex because the current Gen AI doesn't give us that provenance. But I would expect that um, considering this new literacy, right, or even expanding the current digital literacy, it is for us as educators to kind of teach the next generations that they can't use it as is. They need to, to go to the sources. And unless they're able to do that, it, it's not going to be academically viable, period. It's, it's as simple as that. We need to get to the sources. Hi, thank you everyone. I know this has been a long panel, uh, but maybe as we head toward the end, I'm thinking a lot about, um, I mean, if you've just been watching the news lately, there's a lot of discussion about regulation of AI. Now, this is zooming out beyond Wikimedia for a moment. Um, you know, there was a very interesting moment, I think it was a week or so ago, where Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI that develops the GBT models, uh, was before the United States Congress in a very a typical moment asking for them to regulate the industry. And, you know, there may be some, you know, underlying motives and complexities there, but still a notable moment. And I think that <laughs> highlights, and you're hearing people make analogies to things like the, the global nuclear kind of protective regimes that were developed when that technology became quite, quite real and, and evident. Um, and so I'm wondering as Wikimedians and finding this path forward, I actually, I was just noting how the Ada Bridge image is a beautiful expression of this, like the, the negatives, the positives, and then the path forward. What's that path forward? So I'm thinking, you know, there's been, I would love to hear from everyone on the panel, maybe a couple other a sprinkle of comments, and this builds a little bit on Clara's point about developing the right vocabularies. What, you know, what do we need to do in terms of creating policies? Uh, I think the policies are not only important to put guardrails on how we start to in incorporate, and this might be your session, Zico, so. And I know you've been talking about this in the commons context as well. Um, you know, is this something that can go project by project? Is it something that needs to be kind of, uh, and, and you know, these are concepts, we, I think this is actually a fairly urgent question. And I do think to Yael's point about in Silicon Valley, tech companies are being like, hey, what are, you, what are you guys doing? Because I think we can actually be a powerful example of setting, being proactively engaged in the conversation, articulating our values in this new context. So I guess we're not gonna figure that out now, but I'm curious with this question in mind, Maybe we'd love to hear from everyone a quick uh, answer of what is like a, if we were in a, starting a big brainstorm, what's a kind of a potential guideline or an idea of a principle to inform a guideline that you've been thinking about as you've been evaluating these technologies, thinking about scenarios uh, that you would put into the conversation? Not necessarily saying it must be there, but I would love to hear just a, what, that, what that provokes for you and anyone else who sees, uh, uh, has ideas for this. I think that's a perfect question to end us on. So maybe invite Shani and in going down the panel and anything else that you want to leave folks with as we close the panel today. So two things. A, I don't have the answer to your question. I think it's too early. I do absolutely think you're right on, on, the, on the topic that we have to be present in these discussions of policy and regulating it. And I saw it as... Uh, I just had a really good example for that, again, earlier this week with the OECD, where they uh, were launching a new network for schools, and there were many, many representatives from ministries of education, and I also know from ours that they are saying, in terms of the projects that they are funding, don't touch anything with AI. We don't know how to deal with it just yet. We're waiting to see how it's regulated before we are actually exploring it. So I think we have to be in the conversations in the room for sure, because we're leading it in, in a sense. That's one. And the second thing that I want to leave you with, that um, according to what Yael was um, saying, is something that Netta mentioned before, and I think is a really important point. The, the newer generation that is growing up 
knows much better than us, period. The amount of um, apps that are popping up every single day is unbelievable. And the creativity that it, that it enables is unparalleled in a sense. So as educators, that some of you are here, I'm, I think I'm encouraging you to bring your students into the, like Bob was doing with his, bring your students to the, to, into the discussion. Let them tell you what they're doing with it. Let them um, think about that and own the process in a sense, because I think the future will come not from what we tell them. We're here to guide them in a sense, because we understand some of the implications and they might not. But in terms of actual use, we have a lot to learn from them and we, it should be fine to experiment and fail and fail forward, as I've been saying, um, and just iterate and, and try again until we get it right. So that's what I want to leave you with. Absolutely. And as I was saying, this the fourth section of this course is for making these policies. And the teacher is going to come up with a policy, but in terms of using it, students have to be part of it no? and co-construct these policies. And whatever they are, they have to be local and they have to be agile. They are going to change quickly. And here I call to the brave pillar because it's so important to be brave and state w and there is need for a new change in the policy. Let's do it. Yeah, I only want to accentuate the point that Shani made about transparency, like build that trust with your students and make them talk about what AI generative AI technology they are using. I mean, if you censor it, of course, it's going to be more popular among the students and you will never come to know what they are doing. Uh, so talk to them and make sure that they are using it in a meaningful way and engage in discussion with them because it's probably they that who have discovered more use cases of generative AI than we do. Uh, we think that they will use it in this direction, but they might be using it in direction A, B, C, D and so forth. Um, so I think transparency is a big deal when it comes to, you know, talking with students and education. Yes, I agree that we shouldn't be too quick with the new regulations in Wikipedia and um, I made a model about policy layers in Wikipedia and in the movement. Um, I still want to reiterate on this, on trust. Already, when we ask people, do they trust Wikipedia, they have mixed feelings. And it's very strange that we have a reputation of practice. And I want to say, readers read Wikipedia and it seems to be okay. So later they don't find out that it was incorrect, that they got wrong information. So the practice shows, okay, Wikipedia seems to be okay. But with everything we do, and it's not just about what we do, what people suspect us to do. Years ago, people told me, oh, I believe Wikipedia is written by a machine. You know, that this is what it looks like. And we have to be very careful what we, how we present ourselves to others and what we put in our policies. Thank you, Sega. Um, my personal opinion is the policies that exist are sufficient. Um, that, that we collaborate together, we look at what we contribute, and we evaluate what's contributed according to what the pillars are, and I think the policies are sufficient for that. I think a practice that we could engage in is to identify tools that are helpful in editing or identify generative AI tools that are helpful for the task of editing articles. One of the things I think about is pointing out blind spots in sourcing. So you, you can have article that's overlooking um, certain sources and AI could be very good for pointing out what those are. But again, we have to have responsible editors that look at the AI output. So I think that the current system will actually triumph and I think, I think people will come to appreciate Wikipedia for its engagement with these tools. It's a complex question and I think there are many policies in many places in the world that could apply. I will oppose the idea that uh, new generations know better uh, in a sense that um, we call them digital natives but uh, a friend of mine said digital captives like okay they know how to use the app but they don't know what the app 
does really, uh, how it is built, how it is uh, installed. Uh, can you change it? Can I mean, th this is also something that we, we must think about. And for me, the most important thing I have been now in a university with the students the, talking about this is learning how to use responsibly. And that is something that in Wikipedia we could use. I mean, you can, you can use AI systems now in Wikipedia, for example, uh, content translation, but you have to be responsible on uploading a correct translation. And it's your responsibility, not the machine one. I mean, you can just click, 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 and publish, and it won't let you because you didn't change the text. And that is the idea. Um, can we force people to tell, okay, I created this with ChatGPT? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen because it's very difficult. But we can say, like, okay, you are responsible about, about what you upload, and if you upload something that is forced, it will be deleted or it will be challenged, and you, you have to provide, so, provide sources. So this is something that, I mean, um, we can't forbid, but we have the responsibility to teach people uh, how to use it in a responsible way. And as you say, uh, it's, <laughs> if I'm using it, I'm, I'm responsible for what I'm uploading. So that, I think, is the, something we have to work on Wikipedia policies. Thank you all. This was such a fun discussion. I want to make two plugs before we close. One, Zico, what time is your panel or your talk to today? 11.50 or 15? 11.15. 15. 50. <laughs> 10 of 12. <laughs> and Shani, your Facebook group, how do people find that? Shani will post a link to her Facebook group in Telegram. Thank you for that, Liana. Okay, so if you want to like, get access to the group, you can go to our Wikipedia and Education uh, Facebook page. You will see the group uh, being pinned to the top of the page. Thank you, Bukola. I'm going to say that again in the microphone for those streaming. So if you want to join the Facebook group, you can go to the Wikipedia Education Facebook group, and the link is pinned at the top. Thank you all. Please join me in thanking our panelists for such a great discussion. More to come.